All right, well, the title of the message today is on the screen. What does it say? How free will we be in 2022? How free will we be in 2022? What is this a symbol of right here? I don't know, but what's this a symbol? A symbol of what? Freedom. Freedom and liberty. Here it says vaccine passport. If you want, if you really want your liberty, you know what to do. <laughs> now this is supposed to be a symbol for freedom for everybody. But it looks like things are changing. I mean they are changing to the point where liberties are only given to those that follow these policies where I mean, I know a lot of people that were vaccinated and there they came down with COVID just as easily as, as someone that's not vaccinated. So for them to mandate it really doesn't make any sense to me. But this is the times we're living in. But that's the type of message. And we're going to uh, open, open our Bibles at this time uh, to Acts chapter 7. Now, we need to understand that God has always had a church. Since the time of Adam, he's always had a church. In fact, we're going to see that in the Word of God, Acts chapter 7. This is our opening text, looking at verse 38, and look at what the Bible says. And it says, and, and this is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake unto him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto them. So how does, does, uh, does Paul refer to the uh, children of Israel in the wilderness? He refers to them as what? As a church, right? So God has always had a church since the time of Adam. The church did not begin. A lot of people think that the church began in the New Testament. But the Bible calls Israel the church of the wilderness. And Satan's plan from the very beginning, from the fall of man, has been to exterminate God's church. Yes, yes. Satan wants to exterminate God's people since as early as the death of Abel by Cain, Abel was the first martyr. Now, in order to persecute on a larger scale, Satan has set up cities and earthly kingdoms. Right. In fact, the Bible tells us of the first city that was ever built. <laughs> it says, and Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he built her the city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. So what's the name of the first city? Enoch. Now, was that the Enoch that walked with God? No, because that's the descendant of Cain. So here we see that the origin of city life is not from God's lineage, but, at, but actually Cain's lineage, which tells us that it is all part of the devil's plan. You see, packing large amounts of people into close living quarters is not God's plan. That's, that's the devil's plan. He knows that because of our sinful nature, that it will lead to the invention of great wickedness, great crimes, strip clubs, bars, nightclubs, and, 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 and self-worship and the love for material things are all strongly promoted in city life. There's also a higher crime rate in cities than in rural areas. And we're seeing an increase of crime specifically in the big cities, Chicago and Los Angeles, since what? What happened in 2020? That's when COVID came, right? Increase of crime. As, as, as this pandemic has started, so it's, it's, it's a more dangerous place to live, which is why many people are leaving the cities and moving into the country. So it's getting harder and harder to find a country home, which is why God's people need to get on the move. Amen? Amen. But it wasn't long before the love of city life led to the first monarchy or kingdom where one man could exalt himself and control a large group of people. In fact, if you take your Bibles out to the book of Genesis chapter 10, look what the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 10. We see here the first kingdom ever set up. In Genesis chapter uh, 10 verse 8, the Bible says, And Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. And he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, where it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was what? Babel. Babel. So here we see that, that the son of Ham, uh, uh, Cush, begat a, a, a son named Nimrod, 
who set up the first kingdom and enthroned himself as the first monarch of the city of Babylon. And his name is what? Nimrod. Nimrod is the origin of all pagan occult worship. Nimrod's wife and mother, Semiramis, had a son named Tammuz, who claimed, who was claimed to be the son of the sun god, his father re reincarnated, and was so happened to be born December 25th. And so is the origin of our uh, winter solstice celebrations and Christmas holiday that we just passed. And we talked about that a couple of Sabbaths ago. Um, but look what, the, look what the spirit of prophecy says about the Tower of Babel, which Nimrod, of course, he was known to be uh, the one that constructed the, the Tower of Babel. Look what it says about Babel. These Babel builders determined to keep their community united in one body and to found a monarchy that should eventually embrace the whole earth. Thus their city would become the metropolis of the universal empire. Its glory would command the admiration and homage of the world and render the founders illustrious. The magnificent tower reaching to the heavens was intended to stand as a monument of the power and wisdom of its builders, perpetuating their fame to the latest generations. When the tower had been partially completed, a portion of it was occupied as a dwelling place for the builders. Other apartments, splendidly furnished and adorned, were devoted to who? Their idols. The people rejoiced in their success and praised the gods of silver and gold and set themselves against the ruler of heaven and earth. And what did God do with the Tower of Babel? He did what? He divided the languages and shut it down. But here we see the sinful origins of, sin, of, of city life and, and, and the earthly kingdoms, it results in pride, idolatry, and control. And that's why the devil has drawn many Americans into the cities. In fact, look at the increase of urban living in the last 500 years. Everybody living in the country right here, right? But around the 18, 1900s, everyone moved into the into the cities. Now 80% of the population is living in cities. <clears throat> now, in the book of Genesis, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 12, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. We see here that after the Tower of Babel experience, that God raised up a leader named who? Ab Abram, whose name was changed to Abraham. At 70 years old, God called him out to leave his siblings and his cousins and to go into a faraway land. Now, Abraham is revered in the Bible as being the first patriarch. A patriarch is a male head of a family or a tribe. That's what a patriarch is. Now, this calling of Abraham and his immediate family into the wilderness became a tribal fe federation, which eventually became the nation of Israel. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob was named, changed to Israel. And this became the first theocracy. What is a theocracy? A theocracy is a nation governed by God who communicates his will through a priest or religious leader such as Abraham, Jacob, Moses, etc. So here we see the devil setting up monarchies and God's, God's people setting up what? What did God set up? A theocracy. Two different things. Now, this was the way that God planned to lead Israel, a theocracy led by God. But guess what Israel did? They got tired of being a theocracy. They, said, they got tired of being different. That's the way God's people are sometimes. We're, God has called us to be a peculiar people, and we're afraid to be different. Yeah, yeah. And in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, we should know the story. 1 Samuel chapter 8, we see that, that God's people said, we don't, we don't want to be a theocracy anymore. We don't want to be a theocracy. We want something else. We want to be like the world. 
First uh, Samuel chapter 8, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he, he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba, and his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after, after lucre, and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders in Israel gathered themselves together and, and came to Samuel and Ramah, unto Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways, now make us a what? Make us a king to judge us like all the other nations. So they're basically saying, we don't want theocracy anymore. What do we want? We want a monarch. And, you know, you ever notice how the devil always gives you good excuses to, to do wrong? Their excuse was that his sons weren't walking right. Well, guess what? God could have used somebody else. Amen? Mm -hmm. That was, no good, was not a good excuse. We can't listen to the devil's excuses because uh, that, that, that's when we get ourselves into trouble. There is no good excuse to go against God's will. But it was not a good excuse. God could have used anyone to lead Israel. It didn't have to be Samuel's sons. But Israel said, in, in essence, we don't want theocracy. We want a monarch. Now, who was the first monarch? We just looked at it. What was his name? Start with the N. Nimrod, right? And Nimrod, what did he claim to be? He claimed to be God. And it wasn't just Nimrod. What did, what did uh, King Darius want? What, what did Pharaoh want? Pharaoh wanted worship, right? Pharaoh was supposed to be the incarnate of God. And, and uh, Darius, King Darius, the Median king, Everyone was supposed to pray to him, worship. Um, Caesar, what did the Caesars of Rome want? They wanted to be worshipped as God. So uh, when we look at, 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 at who, is, uh, who Israel was really rejecting in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, look at who they were actually rejecting. It says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto their voice of the people, and all that they said to thee, For, for look, they have not rejected thee. But they have rejected me, that I should reign over them. So really, they were not rejecting Samuel or his son. They were rejecting God as their king. And that's what they were saying. They were basically saying, we're tired of God being our king. We would rather serve and honor erring human beings. So look what God said would happen as a result of desiring a monarch instead of a theocracy. 1 Samuel chapter 8, look at verse 11. Follow along. It says, in verse 11, he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots and his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set them to air his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and the instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take a tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and, and give them to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. And he will take a tenth of your sheep, and ye shall be his servants, and ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall have, cho which ye shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a what? A king. God basically told them, this king is going to abuse you. He's going, he's going to be a tyrant at times. Not every king was, but some were. And he will take away your freedoms and your civil rights. But Israel didn't care. They said, what? We don't want theocracy. We don't want God as our king. We want a monarch. We want to serve a man. Now, the big difference between a king and a patriarch was the fact that a king was honored much more than a patriarch and lived a lavish life, which was a setup for self-worship, indulgence, and idolatry. In fact, David and Solomon both fell into the trap of 
indulgence and specifically sexual sins uh, uh, that were basically led to a downward trend in Israel's spiritual condition. Which basically, that's what sexual sins really are. Sexual sins are a form of self-worship. It's about caring more about pleasing our selfish carnal desires than the God of heaven. And this is, uh, this is especially difficult for the rich and famous, the rich and powerful. And what, are, what do many Adventists want? We want to be rich, right? We want to live an easy, lavish life. And we want the same thing for our children so that we can pat ourselves on the back and say, yeah, I'm a good parent. See, my, parent, you know, my, my children, my sons and daughters, they, they have, they're making six-figure sa salaries and they're living in Geist. But you know, the real question is not how much money do your children make and what type of degree do they have. The real question is, is uh, uh, do your children, are they serving God faithfully? Amen? Amen? That's what really matters. And that's really what parenting, the most important thing about parenting is raising up your children to love and to serve God. Amen. But as a result of Israel becoming a uh, or going from being a theocracy to a monarch, what had to happen? Eventually, things got so corrupt in the nation of Israel that God had to use the nation of Babylon to bring them under 70 years of harsh captivity. But after those 70 years, God had mercy upon them and allowed them to rebuild their city. But their kings no longer had complete authority over the nation, but were instead under the domain of the Medes, the Grecians, and the Roman governments. In fact, we know, of course, in um, uh, Luke, you know, it talks about how, the, how Caesar Augustus made a decree that all the world should be taxed. Why could he make that decree? Because he was in control over Israel and the Jews. And they also, the Jews did not have the, the authority to execute Christ. So they had to plead to the Roman governor that, 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 they, would, uh, that they would crucify Christ. But Jesus then started a new concept. He started a new concept in John 18.36. Look at the Bible says in John 18.36. Jesus, this is when he's before Pilate. It says, Jesus answered, my, king, my kingdom is what? My kingdom is not of this world. Amen? Amen? This is what we're under right now. Amen? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight that, that, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. So Jesus kind of started a new principle, a new mind state among the people of God is that our kingdom is not of this world. You see, the old covenant was this with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was that if Israel was obedient, God would bless them and lead them to this earthly kingdom in Canaan, the promised land. But the new covenant is this. Now, of course, we still have to physically survive and take care of, of our physical needs, raising our families and all that. But instead, uh, uh, see, we're not called to build any earthly kingdom. Instead, we are called to build up a heavenly kingdom by going out and preaching a gospel to every creature. Now, how long are we supposed to do that to? Are we supposed to do that until we reach 65 and, and, and retire? No. We're supposed to do that until the day we die. I don't know about you. I plan to be 100 years old at the Super Bowl, preaching the gospel <laughs> on the street corner until I drop dead. If time permits. I don't think it's going to permit because, you know, things, things are going fast. You know, with, with Omicron and Delta and our freedom being wiped away, we're not going to have that much time. I, I'm not going to be able to be 100 years old. But my point is that, that, that we are called to build up the kingdom of God. And that's what, uh, that, that's what our, our focus needs to be on, not on earthly kingdoms. But from the beginning of the Christian church, politics and worship were to be completely what? separate. Now the church still had leaders, you know, we know the church had bishops and elders and, and deacons and all that, deaconesses, but the leaders did not have political authority. 
In fact, in the early church, if you had any type of political authority or position and you became a Christian, in many cases you would lose that position because of your choice to become a, to become a follower of Christ. In fact, that was the case of Paul. In fact, if you take your Bibles out to Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3 tells us what Paul had to give up. But guess what? It really wasn't much for Paul because he really didn't care much about it after he was converted. And we shouldn't either. Amen? Amen. It says, for we are, are the circumstances of Philippians 3, verse 3, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in, in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of the Benjamin, and, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. But doubtless, and I count uh, uh, all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of what? All things. Paul lost everything. Saul lost everything when he became a Christian. He lost his position, his status, his material wealth. I mean, Paul was making, was making a nice salary. He had it good. He had it made. And he left it all. My question, to you, and, and, and then it says, it, it says he counted all that but what? Dumb, it says. <laughs> Verse 8 says, it says, I count them but dumb that I may win Christ. All the material possession, all the things that many Adventists we get so caught up in and absorbed in, and all, many are even depressed about right now. They say, oh, how am I going to get my degree? How am I going to find a job now? We're all depressed about that. The Bible says that Paul counts it all dumb, that he might win Christ. Paul lost everything to become a Christian. The question is, are you and I willing to lose everything for being a follower of Christ? We've worked hard, some of us have worked really hard to get to the place where we are in life. Are you willing to lose it all for Christ's sake? If you're not, Jesus described you right here. Jesus said, and this is the rich and ruler, that thou will be perfect, go and sell what thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The rich and ruler, he died what? A lost man. We have to be willing to, to, to give up all for Christ, just like, just like Saul, and Paul, who became Paul. And you see, when, when the Sunday law comes, many Adventists, just like this rich young ruler, will sorrowfully accept it. Why? Because if we don't accept it, we're going to lose what we worked so hard to get, which was the which was top priority in our life. We'll be just like the rich young ruler. Now, the Christian church remained separate from political governments until the 4th century. Revelation chapter 12. Go to Revelation chapter 12, looking at verse... No, sorry, Revelation chapter 2, looking at verse 12. Look what the Bible says. It says that the angel of the church in Pergamos write, Chuck talked about this last week, these things say thee, which hath the sharp two, uh, sword with two edges, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast dared them which hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast the stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. This is a description of the church of Pergamos, which if you study uh, the seven churches, you'll find that the church of, church of Pergamos was the church of compromise. The church of compromise that as a result of a man named Emperor Constantine joining the church, that paganism crept its way into the church. And that word Pergamos means elevated. <clears throat> they were elevated. Constantine elevated 
the bishops of Rome to become po powerful politicians and political rulers. Church and state came together. And the bishop of Rome eventually became who? The first pope. You see, Satan's master deception was to convince the church that merging church and state will help strengthen and spread, spread Christianity. That sounds like it makes sense, right? If you merge church and state and, 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 and the government starts supporting churches and the churches support the government and they work together, that sounds like it will strengthen the church, right? But instead of it strengthening the church, instead the result was compromised Christianity, corrupted Christianity that was uh, enforced by the laws of the land and led to uh, a false false doctrine full of superstition and pagan practices that were enforced upon the masses and many being martyred and burned at the stake. <clears throat> Look at uh, what Ellen White says in Great Controversy about uh, King Henry IV. You see, uh, Ellen White, she, she talks about how the church dominated the state. Listen to this. This is right from Great Controversy, page 57. A striking illustration of the tyrannical character of this advocate of infallibility was given in his treatment of the German Emperor Henry IV. For presuming to disregard the Pope's authority, this monarch was declared to be excommunicated and what? Dethroned. Terrified by the desertion and threats of his own princes who were encouraged in rebelling against him by the papal mandate. Henry felt the, 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 the necessity of making his peace with Rome. He was afraid. The king was afraid of the, of, of the Pope. In company with his wife and his faithful servant, he crossed the Alps in midwinter that he might humble himself before the Pope. Upon reaching the castle where Gregory had withdrawn, he was conducted without his guards into the outer court. And there in severe cold of winter, with uncovered head and naked feet. This is talking about a king. He's naked in the cold. Uh, in, in the middle of dress, he awaited the Pope's permission to come into his presence. Not until he had continued three days of fasting and making confession did the pontiff con condescend to grant him pardon. Even then, it was only upon condition that the emperor should await the sanction of the Pope before resuming the insignia or exercising the, the power of royalty and Gregory, elated with his triumph, boasted that it was his duty to pull down the pride of kings. So we see that, that, that King Henry IV had to humble himself before the Pope. There's a picture of that right there. Begging the Pope to open his door. Sure, if that was me, I'd go to the door and rebuke the Pope. Now this church and state union lasted, according to the Bible, according to history, for 1260 years, from the year 538 to 1798. But even before the papal reign was over, God would raise up a nation that would become a place of refuge for the people of God. And this is talked about in Revelation 12, 15 and 16. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of a flood. And the earth helped the woman. What helps the woman? The earth. The earth represents a place of what? Do students of Bible prophecy? Waters represents multitudes. The earth represents a place of desolation, represents America, the new world. The pilgrims came to America, the Puritans, and they swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Satan lost a lot of his power when this nation arose. And eventually they received that mortal wound. So Satan sent his armies to, to cast water, the, uh, his armies, the inquisitors, the, the, the crusaders, to persecute God's church. But the earth helped the woman. And God's Protestants, his faithful people, his Puritans, came to America to establish religious freedom. But we need to understand a little thing about our, our nation's history. We need to understand that when the Protestants came, to America, primarily the Puritans, they, they really did not understand religious freedom. They didn't even know what it was. All they knew 
was that they wanted to get away from the Catholics. They wanted to get away from the Church of England. This was just like the Roman Catholic Church, persecuting them just like the Catholic Church. Thus, the early colonies in America were freer than Europe, but they were under a Protestant tyranny. In fact, um, Great Controversy talks about this. 293, it says, It was the desire for liberty of the conscience that inspired the pilgrims to brave the perils of a long journey across the sea, to endure the hardships and dangers of the wilderness, and with God's blessing to lay on the shores of America the foundation of a mighty nation. Yet honest and God-feared as they were, the pilgrims did not what? They did not even understand the great principle of religious liberty. The freedom which they sacrificed so much to secure for themselves, they were not equally ready to grant to others. While the reformers rejected the creed of Rome, they were not entirely free from her spirit of intolerance. The dense darkness in which through the long ages of her rule, popery had en enveloped all Christendom, had not even yet been wholly dissipated. Said one of the leading ministers of the colony of Massachusetts Bay, it was toleration that made the world anti-Christian and the church never took harm by the punishment of heretics. The regulation was adopted by the colonists. Look what it says here. That only church members should have a voice in civil government. That was the early founders of, of America. They said only if you are a member of a church can you lead in this nation. And definitely you cannot be a Roman Catholic. A kind of state church was formed, all the people being required to contribute to support the clergy and the magistrates being authorized to suppress heresy. The secular power was in the hands of the church. It was not long before these measures led to the inevitable result. Which was what? Persecution. So basically, we went from uh, Catholic tyranny to Protestant tyranny. And we see an example of this in Salem, Massachusetts, where uh, 200 wit witches in 1692 were accused of practicing witchcraft, and 20 of them were hanged by Puritan extremists. Was that God's will? We're supposed to hang witches or hang people that are sinners? <clears throat> no. See, they believe that the that government must enforce the teachings of the Bible in order to keep society pure. But then there, God raised up a man named Roger Williams. Roger Williams is the founder of the Baptist Church. And he kind of had a radical idea. Eleven years after the plague of the first colony, Roger Williams came to the New World. Like the early pilgrims, he came to enjoy what? Religious freedom. But unlike them, he saw that so few in his time had yet seen, or uh, saw uh, what so few in his time had yet seen, that this freedom was the inalienable right of all. Whatever might be their creed, he was an earnest seeker of, for truth. With Robinson, holding it impossible that all the light from God's word had yet been received. Williams was the first person in modern Christendom to establish civil government on the doctrine of liberty of conscience and equality of opinions. Roger Williams, before law. He declared it to be the duty of the magistrate to restrain crime, but never to control the conscience. Attendance at the services of the established church, just like in, 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 um, in Europe and by the Catholic Church, they forced church attendance. Well, it's the same thing in, in the early times of Protestant America. Attendance at the services of the established church was required under penalty of fine and imprisonment, which we know that's going to happen soon. A Sunday law. Williams did what? Reprobated law. The worst statute in the English code was that which did but enforce attendance upon the parish church. To compel men to unite with those of different creed, he regarded as an open violation of their natural rights to drag to public worship the irreligious and the unwilling seemed only like required hypocrisy. No one should be bound to worship, or he added, to maintain a worship against his own consent. The, the application of this new doctrine, it was urged, would subvert the fundamental state and government of the country. So Roger William came up with this radical idea that helped pave the way for the writing of our nation's constitution and the Bill of Rights. 
Now, did you all know that when he came up with this idea, this brother was excommunicated from society, uh, from, from the colonies, and he, had, he, he basically went to Rhode Island, and he established these principles on Rhode Island, and after, as the Lord blessed Rhode Island, all the other colonies eventually adopted, and today we have our modern-day Bill of Rights and U.S. Constitution. America is the first Protestant nation and truly free country in the history of the world. You see, in America, we have the right to be Protestant, to be Catholic, to be Muslim, to be Buddhist, to be atheist, and you all have the same rights in this nation that we live. And this is, this is God-ordained. But don't think that because we have these freedoms that the devil just gave up and threw in the town. Revelation chapter 12, 17, we know the verse says, And dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that Satan did not give up the fight after America gained its independence and became the first uh, free country, truly free country in the world, and, and also a refuge for Christians. Instead, the Bible says he specifically made war with the woman who is the church who keep all of God's commandments. And where did Adventism begin? Right in America, just a little north of us. We've been there before, Battle Creek, Michigan, amen? amen. That's where Adventism began. Satan is at war against God's church and against the principles of the Constitution. Satan says, I must destroy America's Constitution because it protects Sabbath keepers, Sabbath keeping Christians from extermination. Now, what tactic does the enemy use to take away our freedoms? Let's go to Proverbs chapter 29, looking at verse 25. Proverbs chapter 29, looking at verse 25. Look what the Bible says. It says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be what? Safe. So as long as we put our trust in God, we're safe from the snares of the devil and from his intimidation. But when we start fearing things, when we get afraid, when we have the emotion of fear, that's when the devil can pull us under, uh, into bondage and into, into captivity. So through fear, Satan says, I will destroy the freedoms of America and the rest of the world. And we've seen this especially since 2001. The World Trade Center, when it, when it uh, came down in 2001, September 11th, two planes go into two buildings and three buildings go down, including Building 7. Explain that to me. So we know that there was definitely more to it than what the official report was. But it was because of fear right after that that Congress rushed the Patriot Act, a 342-page bill, through Congress without them even having time to read the bill. Obliterating our privacy rights. And as a result, the Department of Homeland Security and fusion centers sprung up who are collecting information about you and me on a daily basis. Because everyone's now a potential terrorist. 2008, fear. The banking collapse took place. Putting a nation under the state of fear which led America into the path of economic tyranny, where tax-paying citizens like you and me are, were forced to pay for the mistakes of private banks. How much money did, did we give to Lehman Brothers in uh, AIG? $700 billion. That's how much we paid them to supposedly save us from economic collapse, compromise, freedoms. But what crisis are we in right now? We're in the COVID pandemic, now been what, about two years now? Since this pandemic started, we got the Alpha variant, the Delta variant, and now Omicron, which, which is very highly transmissible. As a result of this crisis, we're seeing more and more vaccine mandates. Vaccines have been strictly enforced in Australia and Austria, Italy, and many other countries around the world. Nigeria states to ban the unvaccinated from banks and what? Places of worship. If you're in Nigeria, 
You're not vaccinated, you can't go to church. Two Southern Nigerian state governors instructed their population to get inoculated against the coronavirus or be banned from religious services and public places, while federal authorities suggested they're considering restrictions to tackle vaccine hesitancy. Large gathering, places of worship, and banks will only be accessible to those with proof that they've received at least one COVID-19 shot from mid-September, Edo State Governor Godwin uh, Abasika said last week. And America's following suit. We're biting his vaccine mandate for all businesses uh, with at least 100 employees. Looks like it's, it's going to go into full effect. This is from CBS.com, a federal appeals court. At first, it, 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 was, uh, it, it was thrown down. Uh, but, but look what it says here. CBS.com, a federal appeals court panel on Friday allows President Joe Biden's COVID-19 vaccine requirement for larger private employers to move ahead reversing a previous decision on a requirement that could affect some 84 U.S. million workers. <clears throat> Just like Ricky brought out Chicago. Proof of vaccination required to enter most businesses in Chicago starting January 3rd. So you got two more days. Most businesses, you cannot even go in there. So you, if you visit in Chicago, and you haven't taken the jab, then uh, you might as well not even go because uh, you're not gonna be able to go in a lot of these places. Probably, you know, if you have to use the bathroom, probably can't even go to the bathroom. But we're at a point now where it's no jab, no jab. There's a movie called Songbird, came out in 2020. This movie is about a, some form of a pandemic where there's medical martial law declared. And you, and you already know Hollywood's all connected with, with the higher ups. Yes. You know, they, they, it's all connected. And uh, in this movie, those who don't get the vaccine or, or who are infected, they're taken into detention camps for those that are sick or not cooperating with the health policies. That's all in the movie. And they're, they're preparing us for this. Now, this is kind of scary right here. You, you see that movie plot, but look at this bill right here. This is right from nysenate.gov. Assembly Bill A416 relates to the removal of cases, contacts, and carriers of communicable diseases who are potentially dangerous to the public health. This is gonna be voted on January the 5th in New York City, which basically could give the government or health officials the right to actually detain, have some form of detention centers for people that are considered a dangerous threat to society because of their either their vaccine status or maybe they have the COVID or whatever. So our personal rights, our personal health rights in America are pretty much gone. I mean, it's already gone in a lot of other countries. We're blessed to be here, yeah, we still have a little bit of freedom, but it's about, it's about gone. And what comes next is our, is our personal right to worship God on the day that God says, which is the seven day Sabbath. A national Sunday law will be enforced. So we need to prepare, amen? amen. But now I'm gonna change gears a little bit and we're going to talk about another type, another topic. Freedom in the family government. Freedom in the family government. We're going to have a free family government in 2021, I mean in 2022. Ephesians chapter 5 tells us how the family government is to be established. Ephesians chapter 5, looking at verse 22, look what the Bible says. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto the husband as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, and is the Savior of the body. Therefore, the church is subject, as, as the certain church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So this is the family government described, how it's supposed to be set up. Husbands are to love and to lead the wife as Christ does what? 
loves and leads the church. Amen? Amen. And then it says that the, the wife is to be submissive and respectful to her husband. In that government, both husband and wife should feel free in the relationship. Amen? Amen. We should feel free. We should, we should be looking forward to going home to our spouses. Amen? Amen. But unfortunately, many people uh, look to people who sleep around with whoever they want as freedom. A lot of young people, you know, we, we look at that. That's what, the, that, that's what Hollywood and the music industry glorifies. And we look at marriage as being this, <coughs> a ball and chain. Is that the way? <laughs> <clears throat> is that the way marriage is supposed to be? No. Unfortunately, marriages, some marriages are burdensome bondage. But what makes what makes it a bondage? What makes it bondage? Look what the Bible says, stand fast therewith, therefore in the liberty where Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoga bondage. That yoga bondage is talking about what? Sin. So what is it, what sins can make our marriage a yoke of bondage? <clears throat> Example number one, lust and adultery. That's the number one cause of divorce in America, is adultery. So if the spouse knows that their spouse is uh, not satisfied with them and is constantly craving another person, another person, man or woman, it will lead to what? Distrust, jealousy, and suspicion. Whereas when there's trust, you know, they, they, they're not so worried and suspicious, but when you lose that trust, now they're doing what? They're spying on you all, all the time. They're, they're spying on you all, all the time. They're inspecting your social media friends and inspecting your texting and investigating everything you do. Does that sound like freedom? No, it doesn't. Now, many times this happens when trust has been violated or when the spouse has been in a previous relationship where trust was violated and, and the spouse is having to deal with that. But God does not want the marriage to be like this. He wants spouses to, uh, to he doesn't want spouses to feel like we're under investigative judgment by one another, amen? He don't want us to feel that way. We are under investigative judgment. But by who? By God, not by any man. God wants us to have trust for one another and to give, even give each other, one another, a level of privacy. Amen? But this is ruined when we're dishonest with one another and when we live in secrecy. The solution is here, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, look what the Bible says in verse 16. It says, This I say, that in walk in the Spirit, ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. And in verse 19, it talks about the works of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are these, which are, are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, <clears throat> variance, emulations, Wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies. Envies, murder, drunkenness, revelings, you know, it gives a whole list. So the only solution to the problem of either lust, adultery, suspicion, envy, is what? Walking in who? Walking in the spirit of God. Amen? Amen. He can give us the victory so that we can feel free in the marriage relationship. Another example. Selfishness, greed, which leads to what? Distrust and anger, frustration. Leads to a spirit of domination where one spouse wants to take total control over the finances in the marriage. And the other one only gets like, like a little allowance as if there's some type of a child. Is that the way God wants marriage to be? You see, that will make marriage feel like a ball and chain. Money issues, by the way, are the second leading cause of divorce in America. You see, when you're single, we can spend money however we want. We got the freedom. You can, you can waste all your money on something. You can spend it however 
you want. But when you get married, it's a little tricky because now you have to consider the other person in your spending, which is why some marriages feel like bondage. Because one wants to have too much control in the spending. But you know the real issue behind money problems is selfishness, amen? It's, it's really about selfishness. Us more caring more about what we want versus what the other person, being considering what the other person wants. First Timothy chapter uh, six talks about this. First Timothy chapter six. It gives us actually the solution to selfishness and materialism. It says, but godliness with the contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in perdition and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil. You see, God's people, we have to learn to be content with what we have and to please others above pleasing ourselves. If we want to end whatever money problems you might have in your, in your marriage. We have to remember that the love of money is the root of all evil. You see, God wants marriage, he wants both partners in a marriage to feel like they have <clears throat> financial freedom. Where both husband and wife, we choose to live selfless, uh, selflessly, not selfishly, but selflessly, and yet we both have the freedom to spend money when we desire things that we need and even that we want. Amen? So that's God's desire, but it only comes when we both want to deny self and, and, and uh, detach ourselves from these material things that we feel like we have to have. Last point I want to bring out. What about children? Should children feel like they have freedom in their home? You know, a lot of uh, a, a lot of Children, you know, they're looking forward to growing up, uh, becoming of age so they can move out and get their own place and get away from mom and dad, never to return. The Bible says, "Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Just as there's freedom in the other nine commandments, there should be freedom in honor your father and your mother, and your days may be long, and children obey your parents in the Lord. That's what the Bible tells us in, in Ephesians 6, 1, children obey your parents in the Lord. There should feel freedom in obedience to the parents. Just like how we feel freedom in obeying God, we should feel freedom in obeying God. The children should feel parents should feel freedom in obeying their parents. Which means that we as parents need to have the wisdom of making rules for our children that are for their well-being and best interest. In other words, every house rule should be what? Reasonable, amen? And lead to the development of the physical, mental, and spirituality of our, of our children. Now the Bible speaks against unreasonable rules. Look what it says in Ephesians 6 verse 4. And ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. What does the Bible say parents shouldn't do? Provoke their children unto wrath. What does that mean in layman terms? It basically means don't make unreasonable rules and unreasonable punishments for your children or you will suffer the results in later years as they rebel against not only you but even against Christ. See, I, I know of Adventist parents who have 18-year-old, 20-year-old sons and daughters living in their home. And they say it's, you can't date nobody. Can't have a relationship. Dating is evil. That's ridiculous. Some parents require their kids stay home all the time because the parents, we don't want to make time to take them out and do things with them. And guess what? Guess who ends up uh, raising the children? You can't go here, you can't go there, TV 
ends up raising the children, and they miss out on going to the wonderful places of nature, lakes and beaches and places that God has created where they can run and, and enjoy life and feel free. Some parents require their daughters to do all the cooking while they have time to do whatever they want to do. Now, I understand we're supposed to teach our children, our daughters especially, how to, how to cook, right? You said what? Sons too, yeah. But to require them to do all the cooking, that's extreme. In fact, the Bible tells us that a virtual woman is going to do what? Proverbs, I think it's what, 30, uh, Proverbs 31 or 30 talks about how a virtuous woman, she's going to wake up early in the morning. The, the mother, she's going to wake up early and she's going to prepare food for her family. Do we do that, mothers and wives? That's what we need to do. So that's extreme, and that's, uh, that, that's not wise parenting right there, to put all the burden on cooking. I mean, that, you know, that, that, that's, that's, that's ridiculous. Um, what about children? Should they have freedom in how they use time? Look what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. The Bible tells us, redeeming the time because the days are evil. That word redeem means to make the best use of. So you see, what we as parents have to do, we have to observe how our children use their time. And we have to help them balance how they use their time. And the better they are at using time in the best way, the more freedom they should have in how they use their time. Amen? But if they're on the 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 game and the phones and what I don't know what whatever y'all got or if they're on that for three hours straight, three four hours straight, then what do they need? They need some help, right? They need some time management help. We need to help them balance their time. So if parents find that that balance in their home, children will look at at home as a place of freedom. If we can find that balance in our home and raising our children with, with godly rules and principles, then they will look at our home at home as being a place of freedom instead of a maximum security prison ready to get out at age 18. Amen? <laughs> so that only takes the wisdom of God. So Lord, help us to have that wisdom as parents. Because not every rule that you had in your home raising, growing up should be the rule that you that you carry on in your family government, amen? You want to make sure that you're led by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. How free are we going to be in 2022? Our immediate future looks pretty grim, but we have to stand up for our freedoms as Protestants. Protestants, that's, that's what Protestant comes from, protest. We need to stand up for our freedoms. We're called to do what? Before the crisis, it said we're called to leave the big cities and move out into the country where there's less restrictions. We're also called to establish freedom in our homes so that husband, wife, and children will delight in the home experience. How free are we going to be in 2022? <coughs> Y'all want that freedom today? By a show of hands? Mm -hmm. Amen. I know I want that freedom. We know that our freedom... To worship will be restricted very soon. But even uh, in that situation, when we're in Christ, we, have, we still have freedom because we have eternal life no matter what happens in this physical body. So the, appeal, the closing appeal is will you make a commitment to prepare for the loss of freedom in America by surrendering all to Jesus? How much? Oh. God wants our whole heart. He wants a total surrender. Maybe we haven't surrendered all. Maybe we've given 80% in 2021. 2022, let's give what? 100%. Amen? Amen? Will you make a commitment to follow the counsels to get out of the city? The world is already chasing after the country homes. You already know that the, the cost of housing is skyrocketing, especially in country, country rural areas. Let's follow that counsel. Let's pray that God will lead us to a place that we can afford. And then you'll, by his grace, win that bid. Because that's, that's, the, that's the problem that people are having. The bidding war is, well, God will bless if you are faithful and sincere. 
Will you establish freedom in your home, your own family government in 2022 so that your marriage doesn't feel like, mass, like a maximum security prison, like your, so that your children don't look at home and dread being in your home and want to get out when they turn of age? If that's your desire, if you just raise your hand, amen. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for giving us your word and giving us this country.